Hello. Um, hang on a minute. Let me just. What's that say? Do, do, do. All right. So we have a full night. We're going to do this. Then we're going to do the trial. Then we're going to do that big box of Happy Mail behind me. Plus, there's a box from Dandy. Plus, I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to relax and unwind. So, get a cup of coffee and settle down. Okay. So, let me go in here. Matthew Coleman. This is good. What, Jimmy? Okay, but I'm live. I'm live. I said I'm live. Glass elements. I hate glass elements. Okay, hello there. Hello, hello, hello. Video Real, Nicole Griffith, Carol Plant. Tammy. Um... Let's see. Deborah Vancouver Dan. All right. Marco K. Kevin Leonard Whisper to Me. Wake Up. Uh, let's see. Sean Sneed. Nicole Griffith, Captain Lee Fan, Tenth Angel. Let's see who else we have here. Isabel. Hey, Isabel. I haven't seen you in a while. Okay. Linda Uribe. Oh, I heard from Nancy. She's not been doing well, I guess, after that fall. She's had in a lot of pain and everything, so prayers for Nancy. But I did hear from her. Irene, I don't know where you are. Hope you're okay. Uh, Jackie Burns, hello there. Jackie Burns, you got my thing, I hope. Brenda DeBerry. Chris Ree. Larky. Linda Gelb, I said, if you're listening, I sent you the money for Tammy Shells. She paid me through Cash App. I paid you through PayPal. All right. Um, let's get, let me get this up here because this is some crazy stuff, okay? Let me get this up here. Oh, boy. Matthew Coleman, if you are forgot or you remember he was the surf school owner, instructor, and one morning he just took his two little children, I believe they were two and ten months, and headed over to Mexico and where he did just the most horrendous thing possible, murdered them in the way that he did. And then he was apprehended and said that he had to sacrifice his children for the, the good of the world. Okay, so we're going to see what's in this affidavit. It's going to tell us about his crazy thoughts on the morning of with text with his wife and all of that stuff. Okay, I'm going to get a drink there. I'm going to make this a little larger if you're reading with us at home. I'll make this as large as I can for you. I'll also put the chat back on. Um, okay, so this is United States District Court for the Southern District of California in the matter of, let's see, this was, let's go over here. See, attached affidavit, okay. This was filed on March 28th of 2022. I, Joseph P. Hammer, being duly sworn, declare and state as follows. 
I am a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, and have been so employed since May 1st of 2016. As a federal agent, I am empowered by the United States law to conduct investigations regarding and make arrests for offenses enumerated in Title 18 of the United States Code. During my tenure as a special agent, I have conducted and participated in numerous investigations of criminal activity, executed search and arrest warrants, and seized evidence of federal cr criminal violations. Since April 1st of 2019, I have been assigned to work violent crimes against children at the FBI's Ventura Res... Okay, Luke, please. Oh, gosh, the repetitive noise. He loves it at the FBI's Ventura Resident Agency. In this role, I am responsible for, among other things, enforcing federal criminal statutes involving the sexual exploitation of children. I have received both formal and informal training from the FBI regarding computer-related investigations and computer technology. My formal law enforcement training includes 21 weeks of education at the FBI Academy, where I took classes on writing affidavits and providing evidentiary testimony, among other topics. Prior to my assignment at the Ventura Resident Agency, I was assigned to the Los Angeles Violent Crime Task Force. As a member of this task force, I investigated various violent crimes, including bank robbery, extortion, kidnapping, and homicide. This affidavit supports an application by the United States of America for a search warrant for Meta Platforms, Inc., headquartered at 1601 Willow Park, Willow Road, Menlo Park, California. Oh my gosh. 94025 to search the following online accounts Instagram username Matthew Tay Taylor Coleman, subject account one, a personal account used by Matthew Coleman, M. Coleman, Instagram username. Love Water underscore Surf, subject account two, a business account used by M. Coleman, collectively the subject accounts as described in attachment A, for content and data from October 1st, 2018 to October 10th, 2021, for items that constitute evidence of violations of federal criminal law, namely Title 18, United States Code, sections 1119 and 1111 foreign murder of United States nationals, the subject offense as described in Detachment B. On September 8th of 2021, a federal grand jury in the Southern District of California indicted M. Coleman for two counts of the subject offense. Three, the facts set forth in this affidavit are based on my own personal knowledge, knowledge obtained from other individuals during my participation in this investigation, including other law enforcement officers, interviews of witnesses, my review of documents and computer records related to this investigation, communications with others who have personal knowledge of the events and circumstances described herein, and information gained through my training and experience. Because this affidavit is submitted for the limited purpose of establishing prob probable cause in support of the application for a search warrant, it does not set forth every fact that I or others have learned during this investigation. T Section 2, Statement of Probable Cause. A, AC reported M. Coleman missing. AC is the wife, okay? 4, on August 9th, 2021, Sergeant Larson of the Santa Barbara Police Department, SBPD, contacted FBI Special Agent Jennifer Bannon regarding a possible parental kidnapping. Sergeant Larson provided Special Agent Bannon with a copy of the missing persons police report that was taken by Santa Barbara PD. I reviewed the police report and I learned the following. On August 7th of 2021, Santa Barbara Police Department Officer Barraga spoke to AC, the wife, via telephone regarding her husband, Matthew Coleman. AC, the wife, reported to the police department that she that she, Matthew Coleman, and their two children uh, RC, 10 months old, and KC, 2 years old, planned to go on a camping trip. Instead, the wife said that Matthew had left their home in Santa Barbara, the Coleman residence, in the family's Mercedes Sprinter van with 
R.C. and K.C., the kids. A.C., the wife, reported that Matthew Coleman did not tell her where he was going and was not answering her text messages. The officer attempted to contact Matthew Coleman via telephone but received no response. On August 8th of 2021, A.C., the wife, called Santa Barbara Police Department to follow up on the previous day's report Santa Barbara Police Officer Michael Chung responded to the Coleman residence and met with A.C. the wife, who, according to R.C.'s birth certificate, she was born in September 2020. According to Casey's birth certificate, gosh, birth certificate, he was born in October of 2018. Both were born in the United States and were U.S. citizens. The time period requested under the warrant to search the subject accounts begins the month of Casey's birth. Requested Santa Barbara Police Department's assistance in reporting Matthew Coleman and their two children missing. Officer Chung asked AC the wife whether she could attempt to use the Find My iPhone application to locate Matthew Coleman's phone. AC agreed and turned on a laptop which showed that Matthew Coleman's last known location was in Rosarito, Baja, California. Mexico at approximately 2.24 p.m. Matthew Coleman is located, returning from Mexico, and R.C.'s and Casey's bodies are found. On August 9th of 2021, at about 11.50 a.m., Sergeant Larson, Santa Barbara Police Department, Detective Davis, and District Attorney Investigator Asian went to the Coleman residence where they met A.C., A.C.'s friends, TC and AP, who explained that AC had just left for San Diego. So the wife left for San Diego. Her friends are at the house. TC and AP showed how they were using Find My iPhone app on a MacBook Pro computer, the MacBook, to track Matthew Coleman's iPhone movements in Mexico towards the San Ysidro port of entry. AP and TC asked for help coordinating the search for Matthew Coleman, RC, and KC. AP and TC show Detective Davis and Asian a text message from M. Coleman's iCloud account on the MacBook. The text message from M. Coleman to AC, so from Matthew to his wife, was sent on August 9th at 3.12 a.m. stating, Hi, babe. Miss you, too. Things have been rough, but starting to get some clarity as well. Still confused on a lot of things, though and processing through. According to Detective Davis's report, AP identified the MacBook as belonging to Matthew Coleman and said that AC was able to log in because she had his password. Later, AP, that's the friend, provided the FBI with text messages between her and AC. These text messages were on August 9th between, and a, between about 1.23 p.m. and 2.33 p.m and they show AC, the wife, providing AP, the friend, with Matthew Coleman's iCloud login and password, and AC asking for any updates on Matt's location, with AP responding, it looks like he is at the border. That's weird. That, that just starts with that. Hold on. I'm going to sneeze. I'm going to sneeze. I'm going to sneeze. Steve's again. No, I'm not. Maybe not. Okay. All right. So it just starts with them. I don't know if they were down to something or what's up. Them. So many crazy thoughts going through my head right now. Hard to explain. Yeah, funny. You're getting some clarity through my grandma's old Bibles. Wasn't there too? Anyways, was actually still thinking of burning them in case there's a chip in them or something. Going to keep processing through everything and hope to get some answers. Hope all this craziness ends soon. Love you. AP and TC also show Detective Davis and Asian responsive text messages from AC to M. Coleman asking if her children were okay, as well as a message from AC to M. Coleman on August 9th at 9.24 a.m. stating, We are doing this together, babe, praying for clarity over you and your mind this morning. 
Everything you've believed and known is true is happening right now. I'm partner partnering with you from SB. Let's take back our city, the gateway of revival for the state of California and the nation and the world. You were created to change the course of world history. Take care of my little giant slayer and my voice of heaven's dove. They sure are special. Sergeant Larson thereafter seized the MacBook and law enforcement obtained search warrants for the MacBook. At approximately 1 p.m. on August 9th, Matthew Coleman arrived at the SYPOE port of entry in the Mercedes Sprinter. Hold on, I've got to take a drink. And just hold him in just a minute. Hold on one second. Hey, Cranky Babushka, good to see you. Okay, so, sorry about that. Um, at approximately 1 p.m., Matthew Coleman arrived at the port of entry right in the Mercedes Sprinter van. Matthew Coleman was referred to secondary inspection. There were no other occupants in the Mercedes Sprinter van, and federal agents took custody of the Mercedes Sprinter van. That same day, a Mexican liaison partner with the Secretaria de Securidad Publica Municipal de Rosarito, relayed to FBI Supervisory Special Agent Joyce Dennis that they located that they had located two deceased children matching RC's and KC's description in a ditch at approximately 8 a.m. on August 9th. C. M. Coleman is interviewed at the port of entry and discusses, among other things, Instagram. Later that day, Matthew Coleman was interviewed by FBI Special Agent Nathaniel Dingle, during which time Special Agent Dingle read Matthew Coleman his Miranda rights, and Matthew Coleman waived his rights and agreed to speak with the agents. I reviewed the video recorded interview during which time Matthew Coleman made, among others, the following statements. A. Matthew Coleman confessed to killing his children, R.C. and K.C. Matthew Coleman said that he drove his children to Mexico on Saturday, August 7, 2021. Matthew Coleman said that he believed his children were going to grow into monsters, so he had to kill them. At approximately 5 a.m. on August 9th, Matthew Coleman drove south on Descanso Road. He pulled off to the side of a road in the area of Rancho del Cielo. Matthew Coleman stated that first he killed R.C. using a spear fish fishing gun that pierced R.C. in the heart. After he killed his children, Matthew Coleman said that he moved their bodies approximately 30 yards away and placed them in some brush. Matthew Coleman stated that he drove a couple of miles where he then discarded the spear fishing gun and bloody clothes near a creek. He threw bloody Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna read this. Matthew Coleman provided agents with the approximate location of the bodies, which coincided with where the bodies were located by Mexican authorities. Okay. He threw the bloody clothes into a blue trash bin somewhere off the side of the road in Tijuana, Mexico. Matthew Coleman said that five or six days ago, he started noticing strange coincidences. He discussed QAnon and the Illuminati conspiracy theories as well as Strong's numbers, an index of every word in the Bible. He said visions and signs revealed that his wife, AC, possessed serpent DNA. Matthew Coleman mentioned that he was not sure if his wife was a shape shifter and had passed it on to his children, and that all things were pointing to the idea that his children have corrupted DNA that will spread if something is not done about it. Matthew Coleman explained that he was either crazy or the only person that is left on earth that is a true man, and that while he was in Mexico before killing his children, Matthew Coleman laid in bed seeing all the pieces being decoded like the matrix and he was neo 
Matthew Coleman also discussed time travel, teleportation, R.C. and Casey telling him about babies being placed in fireworks, food, and walls. M. Coleman explained that his children were communicating with him, that Casey told him that A.C. and a family friend were abusing Casey and R.C., and that eventually Matthew Coleman saw the big picture that he had to kill his children to prevent them from becoming an alien species that would release carnage all over the earth. M. Coleman mentioned during the interview that Q was actively talking to him. The Matrix is a science fiction film. Neo is the lead character. During the interview, Matthew Coleman showed the interviewing agents several hand signals or signs that Matthew said were an indication that someone was part of the conspiracy and showing their allegiance. Matthew Coleman then explained that he scrolled through Instagram and took screenshots of individuals making these hand signals or signs. Matthew Coleman explained that he does not use Facebook anymore, but had recently searched through his friend's AM's Facebook account, that his friend AM's Facebook account, and saw a posted photograph of AM making one of these gestures over his eye. Matthew Coleman showed agents the hand gesture. According to Matthew Coleman, after seeing AM's posting with the hand gesture, Matthew Coleman knew that the whole thing was a setup and they were using people to get to Matthew Coleman. Matthew Coleman identified and initialed photographs of R.C. and Casey's dead bodies as his children. Matthew Coleman said he knew what he did was wrong but it was the only course of action that would save the world. Matthew Coleman signed a consent form allowing the FBI to search his iPhone and provided the passcode. Matthew Coleman makes additional statements about Instagram, religion, and conspiracies. On August 10th, 2021, while I was transporting Matthew Coleman to the Santa Ana jail, Matthew Coleman discussed his religious beliefs, work as a pastor, Nephilim, and the biblical story of Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac. Also, on August 10th, while Special Agent Bannon and I were transporting Matthew Coleman to the Ventura County Jail, Matthew Coleman said that about five days before he left for Mexico, he started to get clarity. Matthew Coleman said he saw messages on Instagram that were showing hand signs provided, proving that they were targeting Matthew Coleman, and Matthew Coleman began to understand what those messages meant. On August 11th, while I was transporting Matthew Coleman from Ventura County Jail to the United States Marshal Service, he explained that he first learned of lizard people on Twitter and from that British guy with white hair. AC is interviewed at the port of entry and discusses, among other things, Instagram. On August 9th, 2021, after Matthew Coleman had entered the port of entry with his chi without his children, FBI Special Agent Zachary Schaefer and Special Agent Jesse Chaffel conducted a Mirandized interview of AC, that's the wife. I reviewed the recording of that interview and observed the following. AC explained that she and her husband were researching QAnon and that Matthew Coleman had become significantly more paranoid that people around him were involved in a conspiracy. AC said that Matthew Coleman started doing a lot of research on leaders running the church and found that they might have been part of the conspiracy. AC explained that Matthew Coleman began seeing signs in people's social media posts and Matthew Coleman believed he was able to connect the people running the church to people in their community and to some of their best friends. And this is... Um, It says, I believe, based on my investigation of this case, that British guy with white hair refers to David Icke, a British conspiracy theorist with white hair who has published several books, including Children of the Matrix, which describes, among other things, Nephilim interbreeding between the reptilians and the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Nordic peoples, reptilian DNA, and royal bloodlines of the reptilian Nordic hybrids and their relation to the Illuminati.
AC said that Matthew Coleman found information on their friends' Instagram accounts that Matthew Coleman believed showed that they were all in this thing together. Matthew Coleman even accused AC of being part of the conspiracy. Matthew Coleman and AC's communications on or about Instagram. Pursuant to the federal warrant, I reviewed M. Coleman's iPhone, which had been seized at the port of entry and found the following. Between October 1st of 2018 and August 9th of 2021, Matthew Coleman exchanged over 400 direct messages using subject account one, which appears to be Matthew Coleman's personal Instagram account and subject account two, which appears to be Matthew Coleman's business Instagram account with approximately 60 different Instagram users. From subject account one, for example, on August 6th of 2021, the day before Matthew Coleman took his children to Mexico, he exchanged four Instagram direct messages with LA. LA asked Matthew Coleman if you guys wanted to do a photo session. Matthew Coleman thanked LA and stated that he had just had a photo shoot. Additionally, subject account one exchanged approximately 10 Instagram direct messages between May 19th, 2021 and July 3rd of 2021 with an Instagram account that I believe to be a personal account belonging to AC, AC's Instagram account. But I was not able to see the content of those messages on Matthew Coleman's iPhone. From subject account two, for example, between July 20th of 2021 and July 27th of 2021, Matthew Coleman exchanged approximately exchanged approximately 10 Instagram direct messages with Instagram user FJ. Subject account two sent multiple photos to FJ that I am unable to see. FJ responded to subject account two by writing, thanks so much. This is going to get them pumped for Thursday and hopefully more days, years to come. Based on the content of other messages in the exchange, and the fact that the subject account two is used as Matthew Coleman's business Instagram account, I believe that FJ was talking to subject account two about the surf business or surf lessons. In addition to Instagram direct messages on subject accounts one and two, I also saw several text messages between Matthew Coleman and others that included links to Instagram posts. For example, on July 20th of 2021, AM sent Matthew Coleman a text, message, a text message with a link to an Instagram account that appears to belong to the United States Marine Corps. The image depicts a Marine in his camouflage uniform. The caption reads, the calm before the storm. That phrase, while common, also is often used by QAnon followers. In reviewing the Instagram post, I found in the comment section that the other Instagram users posted QAnon related comments such as WWG1WGA, which means where we go one, we go all, as well as Trump Q. On August 3rd, 2021, AC, that's the wife, who was listed in Matthew Coleman's phone as a wifey, sent the following Instagram sh screenshots to Matthew Coleman via text message. I know, based on my research and investigation of this case, that these images depict Candace Owen, a popular conservative commentator, according to my review of Instagram. Eyes on the Right 5.0, which is the Instagram handle associated with the screenshots AC sent to M. Coleman on August 3rd of 2021, Super Paragraph 14E writes in its Instagram header, I post on my eyes on the right 4.0 and this is my backup additionally eyes on the right 4.0 writes in its instagram header symbolism is the language of the satanic elite in addition to instagram direct messages and text messages about instagram that i found on matthew coleman and ac's iphones during my review of Matthew Coleman's iPhone, I found numerous screenshots of other people's Instagram posts in which people are posing while making some sort of hand gesture. For example, I found a screenshot that was created on July 31st of 2021 of a musician 
The Instagram post by the musician was dated April 3rd of 2017, and it's a picture of the musician holding up three fingers. Another example I found was a screenshot of an Instagram post that was created on August 6th, 2021. That screenshot depicts a woman and a young boy holding up two fingers and making the peace sign. M. Coleman's friend, A.M., discusses M. Coleman's use of Instagram. On August 20th, 2021, M. Coleman's friend, A.M., was interviewed by Special Agent Bannon and me. During the interview, A.M. told us the following. M. Coleman started noticing signs everywhere, including postings on Instagram from, from musicians, teachers, and his friends. M. Coleman took notice of symbols he saw in photographs. Approximately three weeks before M. Coleman left for Mexico, M. Coleman started asking A.M. about these photographs and the hand gestures and symbols depicted in the photographs. M. Coleman stated the people in the photographs making these signs were evil, disguised as good. Therefore, these people were compromised. A.M. also said that on August 5th, 2021, two days prior to M. Coleman taking his children to Mexico, that M. Coleman, Matthew Coleman, began showing A.M., his friend, screenshots from Instagram of A.M.'s closest friends making hand gestures such as peace signs. Matthew Coleman accused A.M. of being a loyalist, which was why A.M. could not see that he was being controlled. Within hours of Matthew Coleman taking his children to Mexico, A.C., his wife, called A.M. the friend, and A.M. the friend went to the Coleman's residence. A.C., the wife, showed A.M. the friend a Facebook photograph of A.M. the friend and his friends when A.M. was approximately 13 years old, making the photograph over 10 years old. The photograph depicted A.M. and his friends making hand gestures. Based at least in part of these hand gestures, A.M. said that A.C. accused him of being in on it. So what they're saying now is that the wife called the friend over, showed him a photograph of, showed the friend a photograph from 10 years prior of them making hand gestures, which are likely peace signs, and Matthew telling his wife that their friend there, A.M., is in on this because of those signs that happened 10 years earlier, okay? <clears throat> and that uh, A.M. was in on it. And eventually A.C. chased A.M. out of the Coleman residence. So she is chasing the friend out of the residence because the, the husband's saying, based on that, the friend is in on it. <clears throat> okay. Identification of subject account one, subject account two, and AC's Instagram account. After Matthew Coleman's arrest, FBI personnel conducted an open source search through the inter through the internet for Instagram accounts associated with M. Coleman and located subject account one and subject account two. Law enforcement identified subject account one, Matthew Taylor Coleman. By matching the name Matthew Taylor, Coleman and the profile photograph, which shows a picture of Matthew Coleman. Additionally, law enforcement identified subject account two, love water underscore surf, by matching the name of Coleman's business, love water surf. <clears throat> law enforcement agents and officers investigating the case learned the name of M. Coleman's business during their interviews and investigation. For example, Agents have interviewed several employees at Love Water Surf who indicated that Matthew Coleman owned the business. Additionally, the public profile portion of a Facebook account that I believe was a personal account of M. Coleman's 
it has the name Matthew Taylor Coleman and a photograph that matches M. Coleman states that Matthew Coleman is the founder at Love Water Surf School. Subject account one, which also contains the name Matthew Taylor Coleman, has a link in the profile section to lovewatersurf.com. I also believe Matthew Coleman exclusively or primarily operated subject account two because the business is a relatively small surfing school and several employees were temporary, temporary or seasonal. None of the employees that agents had interviewed described their duties as marketing or managing social media accounts. In reviewing M. Coleman's digital devices, agents have not found any communications with or indication he employs a social media manager or marketing arm. M. Coleman appeared to control other digital platforms used as part of the business, including Fair Harbor, which is a business management software platform that M. Coleman accessed from his digital devices and which was used to run all aspects of the business. Matthew Coleman's iPhone and several Instagram direct messages to and from the subject account to and Matthew Coleman's digital devices contain several photos, videos, and URLs related to the Love Water Surf School. After M. Coleman's arrest, investigators conducted an open source search through the internet for Instagram accounts associated with AC and located AC's Instagram account. The account had AC's name and a profile photograph that depicted AC. The FBI has sent letters to Meta requesting it preserve the contents of the subject accounts. Most recently, on January 25th, 2022, subject account one was first preserved on August 9th, 2021, subject account two on August 12th of 2021. Training and experience regarding individuals who commit violent crimes and the use of social media by those who believe in or participate in conspiracy theories. Based on my training and experience and my discussion with other law enforcement personnel, I know that some people who are arrested for violent crimes will feign mental illness, engage in malingering behavior, whereas others may suffer from legitimate mental illness. One way to determine if a person has a legitimate mental illness or is malingering or to determine the extent to which a person understood the nature of their actions is to examine their conduct and communications with others in the time around and leading up to specific events. For that reason, I believe an examination of M. Coleman's social media content and communications will help establish his true mental state leading up to and around the time of the murders, as well as his mental state in relation to R.C., K.C., and A.C., his children and his wife. Additionally, based on my training and experience and my discussions with other law enforcement personnel, I know that people who participate in and believe in conspiracy theories, such as QAnon or Illuminati, will often find like-minded individuals through online groups that are hosted on various social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I also know, based on my training and experience and discussions with other law enforcement personnel, that individuals who participated in and believe in conspiracy theories, such as QAnon or Illuminati, will often communicate with other like-minded individuals on social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as through encrypted chat platforms such as WhatsApp, Signal, and Telegram. training and experience regarding Instagram Meta. Instagram is a service owned by Meta, a United States company and a provider of electronic communication services, service as defined by 18 USC SS 3127 and 2510. Specifically, Instagram is a free access social networking service accessible through its website and its mobile application that allows subscribers to acquire and use Instagram accounts. Like the target account listed in attachment A, 
through which users can share messages, multimedia, and other information with other Instagram users and the general public. Meta collects basic contact and personal identifying information from users during the Instagram registration process. This information, which can later be changed by the user, may include the user's full name, birth date, gender, contact email address, physical address, including city, state, and zip code, telephone numbers, credit card or bank account number, and other personal identifiers. Meta keeps records of changes made to this information. Meta also collects and retains information about how each user accesses and uses Instagram. This includes information about the internet protocol IP addresses used to create and use an account, unique identifiers and other information about devices and web browsers used to access an account and the session times and durations. Each Instagram account is identified by a unique username chosen by the user. Users can change their usernames whenever they choose, but no two usernames can have the same user, but no two users can have the same usernames at the same time, unlike YouTube. Instagram users can create multiple accounts and, if added to the primary account, can switch between the associated accounts on a device without having to repeatedly log in and log off. Instagram users can also connect their Instagram and Facebook accounts to utilize certain cross-platform features and multiple Instagram accounts can be connected to a single Facebook account. <clears throat> Instagram accounts can also be connected to a certain third-party websites and mobile apps for similar functionality. For example, an Instagram user can tweet an image uploaded to Instagram to a connected Twitter account or post it to a connected Facebook account or transfer an image from Instagram to a connected image printing service. Meta maintains records of changed Instagram usernames associated with Instagram accounts and previous and current connections with accounts on Meta and third-party websites and mobile apps. Okay, I'm getting a drink here right here. One second. Okay. Instagram users can follow other users to receive updates about their posts and to gain access that might otherwise be restricted by privacy settings. For example, users can choose whether their posts are visible to anyone or only to their followers. Users can also block other users from viewing their posts and searching for their account mute users to avoid seeing their posts and restrict users to hide certain activity and pre-screen their comments. Instagram also allows users to create a close friends list for targeting certain communications and activities to a subset of followers. Users have several ways to search for friends and associates to follow on Instagram, such as by allowing Meta to access the contact lists on their devices to identify which contacts are Instagram users. Meta retains this contact data unless deleted by the user and periodically syncs with the user's devices to capture changes and additions. Users can similarly allow Meta to search as to search an associated Facebook account for friends who are also Instagram users Users can also manually search for friends and associates. Each Instagram user has a profile page with certain content they create and share. Posts can be viewed either by the general public or by the user's followers, depending on um, privacy settings. Users can customize their profile by adding their name, a photo, a short biography, or a bio, and a website address. One of Instagram's primary features is the ability to create, edit, share, and interact with photos and short videos. Users can upload photos or videos taken with or stored on their devices to which they can apply filters and other visual effects, add a caption, enter the usernames of other users, tag, or add a location. These appear as posts on the user's profile. Users can remove posts from their profiles by deleting or archiving them. Archive posts can be 
posted because unlike deleted posts, they remain on Meta servers. Users can interact with posts by liking them, adding or replying to comments, or sharing them within or outside of Instagram. Users receive notifications when they are tagged in posts by its creator or mentioned in a comment. Users can mention others by adding their username to a comment followed by the at symbol. An Instagram post created by one user may appear on the profile or feeds of other users depending on a number of factors including privacy settings and which users were tagged or mentioned. An Instagram story is similar to a post but can be viewed by other users for only 24 hours. Stories are automatically saved to the creator's stories archive and remain on meta servers unless they are manually deleted. The user names of those who viewed a story are visible to the story creator until 48 hours after the story was posted. <clears throat> Hang on for a second. Instagram also allows users to broadcast live video from their profiles. Viewers can like and add comments to the video while it is live, but the video and any user interactions are removed from Instagram upon completion unless the creator chooses to send the video to IGTV, Instagram's long-form video app. Instagram Direct, Instagram's messaging service, allows users to send private messages to select individuals or groups. These messages may include text, photo, videos, posts, video, profiles, and other information. Participants to a group conversation can name the group and send invitations to others to join. Instagram users can send individual or group messages with disappearing photos or videos that can only be viewed by the recipient once or twice, depending on the settings. Senders can't view their disappearing messages after they are sent, but they do have access to each message status, which indicates whether or not it was delivered, opened or replayed, and if the recipient took a screenshot. Instagram Direct also enables users to video chat with each other directly or in groups. Instagram offers services such as Instagram Checkout and Facebook Pay for users to make purchases, donate money, and conduct other financial transactions within the Instagram platform as well as on Facebook and other associated websites and apps. Instagram collects and retains payment information, billing records, and transactional and other information when these services are utilized. Instagram has a search function which allows users to search for accounts by username, user activity by location, and user activity by hashtag. Hashtags, which are topical words or phrases preceded by a hashtag sign, can be added to posts to make them more easily searchable and can be followed to generate related updates from Instagram. Meta retains records of a user's search history and followed hashtags. Meta collects and retains location information relating to the use of an Instagram account, including user entered location tags and location information used by Meta to personalize and target advertisements. You're not familiar with this case, Kevin? It's the surf school instructor went to Mexico and killed his children. Said that he had to do it because they had uh, reptile DNA. Okay, Meta uses information it gathers from its platforms and other sources about the demographics, interests, actions, and connections of its users to select and personalize ads, offers, and other sponsored content. Meta maintains related records for the Instagram users, including information about their perceived ad topic preferences. This data can provide insight into a user's identity and activities, and it can also reveal potential sources of additional evidence. In some cases, Instagram users may communicate directly with Meta about issues relating to their accounts, such as technical problems, billing increase, or complaints from other users social networking providers, 
like MEDA, typically retain records about such communications, including records of contacts between the, the user and the provider support services, as well as records of any actions taken by the provider or user as a result of the communications. For each Instagram user, Meta collects and retains the content and other records described above, sometimes even after it is changed by the user, including usernames, phone numbers, email addresses, full names, privacy settings, email addresses, and profile bios and links. Procedures for electronically stored information. Federal agents and investigative support personnel are trained and experienced to identify communications relevant to the crimes under investigation. The personnel of META are not. It would be appropriate and it would be inappropriate and impractical for federal agents to search the vast computer network of META for those relevant accounts and then to analyze the contents of those accounts on the premises of META. The impact of META's business would be disrupted and severe. Therefore, in order to accomplish the objective of the search warrant with a minimal interference within the business activities of META to protect the privacy of META's subscribers whose accounts are not authorized to be searched and to effectively pursue this investigation, the FBI seeks authorization to allow META to make a digital copy of the entire contents of the subject accounts. That copy will be provided to me and to any authorized federal agent. The copy will be imaged and the image will be analyzed to identify communications and other electronic records subject to seizure pursuant to attachment B. Relevant electronic records will be copied to separate media. The original media will be sealed and maintained to establish authenticity if necessary. Analyzing the data to be provided by META may require special technical skills, equipment, and software. It may also be very time-consuming. Searching by keywords, for example, often yields many thousands of hits, each of which must be reviewed in its context by the examiner to determine whether the data is within the scope of the warrant. Hey, Nancy Abbott back. Hold on, I have to get a drink. I'm just going to take a little break here for a minute and just see what's going on here. Hi, Karen H. Hi, uh, Nancy, Alicia. Where are you going? You're not going anywhere. Dare to be different. Matthew Coleman tried to save the world from monsters, and he himself turned out to be the monster. Yes, he did. Hi, Margot K. Everybody, wake up. Hmm. Okay. We're learning a lot about Instagram. My goodness. I dub on the move. Okay. Analyzing the data to be provided to be provided by Meta may require special technical skills, equipment, or software. It may also be very time consuming. Searching by keywords, for example, often yields many thousands of hits, each of which must be reviewed in its context by the examiner to determine whether the data is within the scope of the warrant. Merely finding a relevant hit does not end the review process. Keyword searches do not capture misspelled words, reveal the use of coded language, or account for slang. Keyword searches are further limited when electronic records are in or used or use foreign language. Certain file formats also do not lend themselves to keyword searches. Keyword search text, many common electronic mail, database, and spreadsheet applications, which files may be attachments, do not store data as searchable text. Instead, such data is saved in proprietary non-text format. And as the volume of storage allotted by service providers increases, the time it takes to properly analyze recovered data increases dramatically. Internet service providers also do not always organize the electronic files that they, the electronic files they provide chronologically which makes review more time consuming and may require the examiner to review each page of record for responsive material. <clears throat> I 
based on the foregoing searching and then the recovered data for the information subject to seizure pursuant to this warrant may require a range of data analysis techniques and may take weeks or even months. Keywords need to be modified continuously based upon the results obtained and depending on the organization format and language of the records provided by the ISP, examiners may need to do a review, may need to review each record to determine if it is responsive to attachment B. Okay, let's see here. The personnel conducting the examination will complete the analysis within 90 days of the receipt of the data from the service provider absent further application by this court. Based upon my experience and training and the experience and training of other agents with whom I have communicated, it is necessary to review and seize all electronic messages that identify any users of this subject account and any electronic messages sent or received in temporal proximity to relevant electronic messages that provide context to the relevant messages. All forensic analysis of the image data will employ such protocols directly directed exclusively to the identification and extraction of data within the scope of this warrant. And based on the foregoing, I recommend, I request that the court issues the proposed search warrant. Pursuant to the presence of a law enforcement officer is not required for the service or execution of this warrant. The government will ex execute this warrant by serving it on MEDA because the warrant will be served on MEDA, which will then compile the requested records at a time convenient to it. Responsible cause exists to permit the execution of the requested warrant at any time in the day or night. Native Platforms is an internet service provider headquartered at 1601 Willow Road, Menlo Park, California, 94025. Okay, and then it says, then it gives the Instagram username, Matthew Taylor Coleman, subject one account, Instagram username, lovewater underscore surf, subject account two, collectively the subject accounts. And then this is just saying, um, let's see what it says here, the search of the data supplied by MEDA pursuant to this warrant will be conducted by the FBI and any government personnel working with the FBI as provided in the procedures for electronically stored information section of the affidavit submitted in support of this search warrant and will be limited to the period of October 1st, 2018 to October 10th, 2021 and to the seizure of data, communications, records, and information. Tending to show Matthew Coleman, AC, the wife, RC, and Casey, the kids, travel inside or outside of the United States. Tending to indicate Matthew Coleman's state of mind, competency, and or coherence in relation to AC, RC, and Casey, and the subject offense. Tending to indicate a plan to commit the subject offense or conceal the commission of the subject offense. Tending to indicate interest in QAnon, Illuminati, or conspiracy theories about the use, purchase, or acquisition of a spear or fishing gun and tending to identify the use of subject account one or subject account two, which is evidence of violations of Title 18, United States Code sections 1119 and 1111, foreign murder of U.S. nationals. Okay, so what did we get out of that? We got a lot about Instagram and how it works if you didn't know. But we also found out that his wife chased a friend out of the house because Matthew said a sign that he made when he was young, 10 years, at least 10 years prior in a picture, was a sign that was troublesome because it, this is what they said, okay, but a lot, they were just peace signs that, that meant that they were involved in this conspiracy. Not true, though. And so his wife was also looking up these things, but she does not seem to think her children um, were, you know, had to be sacrificed as Matthew did when he took off and then murdered his children. So texts, you know, show that his state of mind is, he's going through everything and 
you know, he's sitting there, he thinks the ma he thinks he's a character in the Matrix, and that he's seeing all this stuff, and that his kids are telling him all this stuff, that babies are being put in fireworks, and in walls, and in food, and everything else, um, just crazy stuff, and, um, yeah, just really crazy, crazy stuff. Linda, she didn't know that he was going to kill the kids. No, that's not what I'm saying. But look over here. What I'm saying is she knew he was into QAnon. She was looking at it too. She didn't know he was going to kill the kids. They were supposed to go on a camping trip. Um, but she knew that he said that the friend might be involved and chase that friend out of the house. That's what I'm saying. She was devastated, of course. Um, she didn't know that he was doing that. Hi, Liz Tops. Oh, my goodness. I have to take a break here for a second, my neck. Um, Linda was answering a question in chat. Oh. Okay, let me go back to something else right here with this. One second. So, Just hours before Matthew allegedly killed his children with a spearfishing gun in Mexico, he exchanged texts with his wife, Abby, who is referred to in this affidavit as AC. This is the 30-page application for the search warrant where agent Joseph P. Hammer details the ex text, exchange text exchanges between Matthew and Abby Coleman. And that happened on the morning of August 9th of 2021. And that would be the day that he allegedly killed their children, Khalil, two, and Roxy, 10 months, who were referred to as Casey and R.C. in this affidavit. At 3.12 a.m., Matthew allegedly sent a text to his wife, Abby, in response to a previous text she had sent to him, saying, Hi, babe. Miss you, too. Things have been rough, but starting to get some clarity as well. Still confused on a lot of things, though, and processing through them. So many crazy thoughts going through my head right now. Hard to explain. Yeah, funny you're getting some clarity through my grandma's old Bibles, he continued. Wasn't there too? Anyways, was actually still thinking of burning them in case there's a chip in them or something. Going to keep processing through everything and hope to get some answers. Hope all this craziness ends soon. Love you. Less than two hours later, Authorities allege that Matthew brought the children to a field where he stabbed them both in the chest with a spearfishing gun and hid their bodies underneath some brush. The bodies were discovered by a farmer later that morning. Around 9.24 a.m., hours after the time officials think the children were killed, Abby texts her husband. And she says, we are doing this together, babe, praying for clarity over you and your mind this morning. Everything you believed and known to be true is happening right now. I'm partnering with you from SB. Let's take back our city, the gateway of revival for the state of California and the nation and the world. You were created to change the course of world history. Take care of our little giant slayer and the voice of heaven's dove. They sure are special. The affidavit does not provide further context of the subject matter of the text. Matthew was then arrested at 1 p.m. 
that day as he attempted to cross the border into the United States. According to the affidavit, the two FBI special agents interviewed Abby after reading Miranda rights to her. Authorities allege that Abby explained that she and her husband were researching QAnon and that Matthew became significantly more paranoid that people around him were involved in this conspiracy. The affidavit also details memes and screenshots between Abby and Matthew in which they discussed hand gestures being made by famous people. The FBI agent alleges that Matthew interpreted the gestures as secret signals that they were part of the satanic elite. Abby, oh no, hold on. Matthew Forty has pled guilt, not guilty to federal charges of murdering U.S. nationals on foreign soil. He is being held without bond at an undisclosed federal prison in California, and he's undergone psychological testing to determine his state of mind. Let's see here. In the months before Matthew was arrested for allegedly killing his children, he began investigating conspiracy, uh, investigating conspiracy theories with his wife, Abby. On August 7th, the Colemans were packing for a family trip. Authorities alleged that Coleman abruptly put his two kids, Kaleo 2 and Roxy 10, into his van and drove away from their Santa Barbara, California home. And if you remember, he put Roxy, the 10 month old, in a box, not even in a car seat. Abby called police out of concern. According to the FBI's report, she told authorities that she and her husband had not been arguing and that there was no marital strife. She told the police that she did not believe that the children were in any danger and that she thought Coleman would eventually return home with the kids. But police say that Coleman did not return and instead drove the children into Mexico. Two days later, authorities allege that he took the kids to a ranch where he killed them with a spearfishing gun and returned to his hotel room a few hours later. He was arrested when he attempted to cross the border back into the United States. He allegedly told agents that while he was in Mexico, he had laid in the bed, seeing all the pieces being decoded like the Matrix and that he was Neo. He had visions and signs that revealed that his wife, A.C., Abby Coleman, possessed serpent DNA. Matthew Coleman mentioned that he was not sure if his wife was a shapeshifter and had passed it on to his children and that all things were pointing to the idea that his wife had corrupted DNA that will spread if something is not done about it. One of Coleman's childhood friends said that the sudden violence is still hard to fathom. They both always talked about hidden meanings and conspiracy theories, but nothing really alarming it was this it was bible numerology and other things like that it just seems that he went further than she did coleman's being held in a federal prison without bond he has pled not guilty to the murder charges okay so that's what we have there and let me go to the chat now and see what's going on he took the red pill thank you so much okay so that's crazy, right? Kill your kids. You think they have serpent DNA and this is nuts. I think this guy will be spending his life in prison. Karen H. says he won't be getting sympathy for QAnon Illuminati beliefs. No, he won't be getting sympathy because he killed his kids with a spear fishing gun because he thought they had this is nuts. Nuts, nuts, nuts. Hi, easily distracted. I could easily disapprove, disprove to them these crazy things, but they never would listen. Yeah, that's scary, isn't it, when they think these crazy things are true? It's a crazy case. It is. Two beautiful kids, their life's gone. He took their lives. They it's just, it's unbelievable. And, and if you looked at their Instagram, they were, you know, documenting these kids' lives. They were so happy to have these kids, and then it just takes them and kills them with the spear pitching gun. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable. I don't understand. It's just nuts. So that is that. I think, when is my next live? When's my next live? Let me see. 
the world is going crazy. Yeah, we can, um, I think my next live is 1245, isn't it? When's my next live? Because I'll, do, I'll go through the headlines. Um, hi, Hurricane Hunter. Not, not, no, she didn't know he was going to kill the kids. Uh, she did chase a friend out of the house because they thought he was involved because there was hand signals, which a peace sign to them was a hand signal that sometimes, you know, I, it, from, a, from a photo when they were kids. Um, so she had, she had some, some thoughts. But she, she wasn't involved with their murders, no. Hi, Carol Clark. Does uh, anybody know what time my other live starts? I think it's at, what, 1230? 1245? 1230, 12, 45. That took us an hour and 15. I'll go over the, I think it's 1245. Let me just check, because if it is, I'll just go over the rest of the uh, true crime headlines. Um, let's see. Let's see what time the other video is. The other video is. Okay, so this would be upcoming, upcoming, upcoming. Which one's coming first? Brophy trial's coming first? Yeah, because then we're going to relax and unwind. So let's see what this is. Okay, we have 30 minutes. Let's go over the um, true crime headlines then. See what's going on. So I didn't look at anything to it. Okay, Florida boy dies as teens take. Oh my goodness, this is crazy. Florida boy dies as teens take turns shooting at each other wearing body armor. This is. Unbelievable. Two Florida teens initially blamed the fatal shooting of a 16-year-old friend on unknown people who opened fire on the home, but another teen gave police video he recorded of what really happened. 16-year-old Christopher Leroy Broad Jr. died on April 3rd after Joshua Vining, 17, shot him while the two were taking turns shooting at each other wearing body armor. Vining has been charged with aggravated manslaughter of a child with, of a, child with a firearm and another 17-year-old, Colton Whitler, has been charged with providing false information about the shooting to law enforcement. Both Vining and Whitler have been charged as adults. According to the arrest affidavits, two other teens were present at the time of the shooting, including 18-year-old identified as Evan Vowell, who recorded the incident in two separate videos on Snapchat, and Vowell told investigators that Vining showed the group a 9mm handgun and the vest and asked if they had ever seen anyone get shot with a bulletproof vest on. Vowell's first video shows Vining wearing the vest as Broad fires one shot at him, and then the two switch roles for the second video, and Vining shot Broad once. Broad nodded, and then Vining shot him four more times. But one of the bullets hit Broad in an area uncovered by the vest. Oh my gosh. When police arrived at the scene, they found Vining performing CPR the 16-year-old was taken to HCA Florida Ocala Hospital where he was pronounced dead. It's unbelievable. 
Initially, police said they were unable to get information because Vining was distraught and was taken to the hospital with a panic attack. Whitler, who called 911, had told a dispatcher that unknown people opened fire at the home, hitting Broad. He said that he didn't know how many people were involved. Police went to the hospital to speak with Vining, who told them that he fired at a vehicle that was leaving the area after the shooting, using a gun that his father left for him for protection. Both Whitler and Vining said there had been two other boys present and that they had left after the shooting. But when police found the two boys who had left the house, the story began to unravel. The first boy, a juvenile, said he did not see the shooting, but Vowell told investigators that he had recorded two videos and deleted the video of the fatal shooting. He agreed to let officers take his phone to recover the deleted file. When Whitler was interviewed by police, he told them that he, Vining and Broad, had been hanging out together with two friends when two friends came by. He said that Broad put on the vest and asked to be shot, something he said boys had done in the past. After Broad was shot, he said the other two boys left. Bellevue Police and Marion County prosecutors met several times to discuss the case before prosecutors decided to charge Vining and Whitler as adults. They were arrested on Thursday. Vining was given a $30,000 bond while Whitler was given a $1,000 bond. Both boys posted bond and were released. Unbelievable. Um, what's the matter? Something's wrong with the volume or something? What's going on? You know, when you look at those boys, they're playing a stupid game that boys may play, right? Here, put this on, I'll shoot you. And they shouldn't have been playing with a gun, number one. Um, it shouldn't have been where they could get it, number two. It is something, just just a split second, changes so many lives forever. Just a stupid, stupid thing. And, and taking videos of it, right? Taking videos of it, probably for a TikTok or something. Crazy. Hang on. Okay. Pennsylvania woman was criminally charged last week for allegedly holding her one-year-old daughter's head underwater. On March 25th, Rennell Wolf, 21, was staying at a Robinson Hotel with her daughter and a 15-year-old girl when she allegedly slapped her daughter on the stomach for soiling herself. One years old, soiling herself, okay? The teen said Wolf then threw her daughter, threw her, in the bathtub and filled it with two inches of water. When the toddler began to cry, Wolf allegedly pushed the side of her head to the bottom of the tub, forcing half of her face partially underwater. The 15-year-old said that Wolf held her daughter underwater in the running bathtub for 8 to 10 seconds while yelling for her to shut the F up. Okay. The toddler reportedly coughed up water from her nose and her mouth once she was freed. Wolf left the girl alone in the running bathtub, but the 15-year-old cleaned and dressed her. The 15-year-old girl told a woman about the March 25th incident. The woman told the police that Wolf would leave her one- and two-year-old daughters for days at a time, and the children would be dirty and smell. The woman and her mother informed North Fayette and Finlay police on March 21st that they could no longer watch the girls. 
Wolf was under the influence when she was arrested on charges of aggravated assault, reckless, recklessly endangering another person, and endangering, endangering the welfare of children. Court records indicated that Wolf is free on bond, and she is due back in court on April 19th. It's wonderful. Let's hope they didn't give her kids back, okay? Just, this is just insane. Missouri mother and her wife have been charged with interference with custody and the disappearance of three young boys last month. Court documents say that Brittany Barnes and Soraya Beverly picked up the three boys from their grandmother's home for an unsupervised visit on March 23rd. The grandmother, Audrey Beverly, is the custodial guardian of Ryder Green 10, Reese Green 9, and Romello Green 8. Barnes and Soraya Beverly picked up the boys to take them to a scheduled court appearance that day, but neither they nor the children showed up, prompting the court to begin looking for them. Investigators believe they are in Tucson, Arizona area, where Barnes's mother, Shelby Tackett Barnes, lives. Tackett Barnes initially told police she knew where her daughter and the children were, but she stopped cooperating when she learned that the children would be returned to Missouri and put into the state's custody. Police reports say that she has since told investigators she didn't know where the children were and that she had limited contact with Barnes, that the children were not in Arizona and that her daughter was not going to sue everyone for taking her kids and that Barnes hadn't broken any laws and was now an Arizona resident. Investigators said that on March 31st, the children's food stamp card was used in Queen Creek, Arizona, just outside of Phoenix. Court records say Barnes, the biological mother of the children in Beverly, lost custody of the children in January over allegations of drug use, criminal activity, lack of, super, lack of supervision, and lack of school attendance. Romello is described as 4 foot 3, 74 pounds, Reeson is 4 foot 4, 77 pounds, and Ryder is 4 foot 9 and 116 pounds, and all of the boys have brown hair and eyes. The two women are both 30 years old, Beverly is five foot two and one hundred and seventy pounds, and Barnes is five foot seven and one hundred and thirty pounds, with brown hair and blue eyes. And Beverly has brown hair and eyes. Missouri authorities say that the Arizona agencies and the FBI are assisting with the case, and anyone with information is asked to immediately dial nine one one to contact the nearest law enforcement agency, or call the Springfield, Missouri Police Department at four one seven eight six four eighteen ten. A man allegedly shot and killed his estranged wife their son, and their son's ex-wife at a Mississippi home on Thursday before turning the gun on himself. Jackson County deputies were responding to reports of shots fired when they heard a final shot, which they believe was Thomas Griswold, age 64, fatally shooting himself. He was ultimately found deceased at the Latimer residence in addition to his estranged wife, Veronica Griswold, age 64, <coughs> their son, Beyond Griswold, 36, and Beyond's ex-wife, Jillian Pavolino, 39. The triple murder-suicide stemmed from a domestic incident, but specifics regarding that incident were not disclosed. The incident remains under investigation. This is just like becoming the norm now. This is the way that people have problems by killing each other and then killing themselves. How many of these have we seen in the last week? I think there's at least four or five that we've covered here alone in the last week. The world is turning into a crazy place. You just think, that who are these people that just do this? Oh, my gosh. This stuff.
stuff is just A New York man will spend decades behind bars for the senseless beating of his seven-week-old infant. Tyler Zog, 20 years old, has been sentenced to serve 30 years in prison for the death of his, no, uh, for the death of his newborn, Noah Locke, who was just two months old when he passed away last year. You, Mr. Zog, will never, were never a father to Noah, Warren County Judge Rob Smith, said to the defendant during sentencing this week. Instead, you were his and every child's worst nightmare. You are a monster. As a father to two boys, I cannot even begin to fathom how you could commit such violent acts towards an innocent baby. The incident, according to the court documents, happened on July 5, 2021, in Glens Falls. As Zaug, who was supposed to be caring for the baby, Zaug initially told the baby's mother that he was giving Tyler a bath when the baby slipped and hurt himself. Well, let's hold on and see what's going on here. Wait a minute. grand jury in the county of Warren by this indictment hereby accuses I think this is up by you Lisa H I'm very I'm fairly certain that's where Glens Falls is up by you a class B felony in violation of section 120.103 of the penal law of the state of New York committed as follows that on or about the second day of July 2021 through on or about the fourth day of July 2021 in Warren County under circumstances Convincing a depraved indifference to human life, Tyler Zaug recklessly endangered, excuse me, recklessly engaged in conduct which created a grave risk of injury of death, excuse me, grave risk of death to another person and thereby caused serious physical injury to another person, a child with the date of birth of May 10th, 2021. The grand jury of the county of Warren, by this indictment, hereby accuses Tyler Zaug of assault in the second degree, a class D felony in violation of section code 120.059 of the penal law of the state of New York committed as follows that on or about the second day of July, 2021 through or on or about the day of 4th of July, 2021 in Warren County being 18 years old or more and with intent to cause physical injury to a person less, hold on a minute. Then seven years old, the defendant causes, causes such injuries to such person, a child with the date birth, the date of birth of May 10th, 2021, the grand jury of the County of Warren by this indictment hereby accuses Tyler Zog of assault in the second degree, a class D felony in violation of section, of, okay, we know that, that, uh, on, okay, well, let's go over that again. The grand jury of the County of Warren by this indictment hereby accuses Tyler of endangering the welfare of a child and he knowingly, he, the defendant knowingly acts in a manner likely to be injurious to the physical, mental, or mor moral welfare of the child with the birth date of May 10th, 2021. Hold on a minute. Hang on a second, let me get this. I understand that a lawful sentence. I gave you, um, I, I did. Um, okay, maximum incarceration. Okay, what is this? If this court imposes, we don't need that. I thought this was, let me see. This is not what we will want. The, let me just get where we're going to. Here. Yeah. I'm just getting to it. 
there's a lot of stuff in here we're not going to go through and read. This is all the, I'm trying to get what he, uh, oh, here at this, okay. So, the defendant did violate section 120 of the penal law, okay. Um, assault in the second degree, a person is guilty of assault in the second degree with the intent to cause physical, serious physical harm to another person. He causes such injury to such a person or to a third person. To wit, on this day, time, and location, the above named defendant, Tyler Zhao, did with intent to cause serious physical injury to another person. He caused such injury to such person. Specifically, the above named defendant did strike the victim, date of birth, 5-10-2021, in the torso with a closed fist causing the victim to suffer multiple fractured ribs. The complaint it is based upon information and belief, the source signed written statement, verbal admissions of the defendant, and a police investigation. Supporting a uh, deposition, let's see here. I thought they had the, uh, there's so many papers here. Oh, here, okay, this is what we want. Voluntary statement, not under arrest. Glens Fall Hospital Emergency Room. Okay, so this is the uh, voluntary statement, not under arrest. So I am sure he's saying he was at the Glens Fall Hospital with an emergency room with my mom, her name, and investigator James West talking about an incident involving my almost eight week old son today at 5.49 p.m. and eight something p.m. I had four missed calls from my boyfriend. Oh, this is the mother saying this. And who is the father? I called, hold on, why is there, why do they have, um... Okay, I called Tyler back. And he told me he was giving the baby a bath and he slipped under the water. He told me the baby wasn't moving and I need to come home. I hung up and called him back and told him to call 911. And then my mom drove me to the emergency room at Glens Falls Hospital. I don't know who asked me at the ER, but someone asked me about the bruises on the baby. I did notice bruises on his head and forehead and face and stomach, and I never saw him hurt himself. The injuries only started about two weeks ago. Oh my gosh. I have never seen Tyler do anything bad to the baby. Tyler did get fined from his, fired from his job today at Walmart on Quaker Ridge for calling too many times. Okay, hold on, I've got another continuation of this, hang on. I have no idea what happened today at the apartment. The baby wasn't a planned pregnancy and Tyler wasn't happy at first. But when I, but when I'm around Tyler and the baby, he is good with the baby. Tyler has made comments in the past that if a child is abused, they always blame the dad. I asked Tyler once what was going on and if he did anything to the baby and he got really upset with me. I did tell Tyler not to give the baby a bath tonight until I got home from my mother's. Hang on a minute, let's see here. Let's 
Some of my papers here that I'm going through. Okay, here we go. So Noah was rushed to the Albany Medical Center, but subsequently passed away. An autopsy report indicated that he had cracked ribs and a brain injury. Tyler Zog was later arrested and charged with manslaughter after the prosecution accused him of hitting Noah in the face with a closed fist, causing the victim to sustain significant brain injury. Tyler also hit the infant in the torso with a closed fist, causing him to suffer multiple fractured ribs and substantial risk of danger to his life before holding the victim under the bathwater. In February of 2022, Tyler Zaug confessed to the incident and pled guilty to manslaughter and child endangerment. According to one of the media sources, the courtroom was so quiet that you could hear a pin drop as Noah's family gave their victim's family statement during the sentencing hearing. And Just disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. That's the uh, father that, uh, father, I don't even think you can call him a father. Admits to, uh, apparently he, and choking back tears, admits punching, biting, and holding underwater his seven-year-old son Noah in June and July. The child died on July 16th. Guilty please. To manslaughter and assault will land him in prison for 32 years. It's worse and worse and worse. Couples that would have died for that baby. Wait to these people and they kill them. Out of control. Okay. An OnlyFans model and Instagram influencer has been hospitalized under Florida's Baker Act after she allegedly stabbed her boyfriend to death at a Miami, Miami high-rise last weekend. Christian Abumselli, Abum 27, was fatally stabbed by 25-year-old Courtney Clenny. Clenny is known as Courtney Taylor on Instagram, where she has 2 million fans. 2 million. Police say they responded Sunday night to the one Parazo luxury apartments and found Christian with a stab wound to the shoulder. He was pronounced dead at the hospital. Police say at the time they took the woman into custody, but she was threatening to kill herself and officers took her to the hospital. Florida's Baker Act allows police, doctors, mental health professionals, and judges to send someone who displays violent or suicidal tendencies to a mental health treatment center for up to 72 hours. Clenny has not been charged in the incident, and police say they are still working to determine if she acted in self-defense. 
They said that they've responded to multiple calls to the apartment in the last three months. Friends of the couple say they couldn't imagine Abuamseli Abu being aggressive towards his girlfriend. We've seen him hit her. I've never seen, no, excuse me. We've seen her hit him. I've never seen him hit her, said Ashley Vaughn. Adding that friends believe that Christian wouldn't put her in a position where she would need to stab him to protect herself. But a neighbor told the media that he could see into the apartment and that Clenny was being abused. I could not tell if it was open-handed or closed-handed, but he was swinging at her. So I wonder if she still has her, um, let me see. Wow, it's a little provocative. Uh, the first um, <clears throat> one, I won't even show that. That's her Instagram. So she's on OnlyFans. We can imagine what's happening, I bet, on OnlyFans. Um, yeah. Okay. So if we have anything else, I think we have a few more minutes. Florida again. <clears throat> Florida just is like a homeless man in Florida accused of randomly killing a 14 year old child has been found mentally competent to stand trial. The Palm Beach County Circuit Judge Charles Burton announced that two psychologists found murder suspect Semi Lee Williams, age 39, competent to stand trial in connection with the 2021 death of Ryan Rogers. The details of the findings, however, have not been made public. Psychologists Adam White and Stephen Alexander have reportedly been asked not to discuss any details of the case. Williams was first charged with murder with a weapon in December of 2021. Williams, a homeless drifter, is accused of killing Rogers, who vanished from his Palm Beach Garden home on November 15th of 2021, and he was found fatally stabbed three miles from his home near Interstate 95 the next day. Authorities believe that Williams killed Rogers where his body was found on November 16th. Palm Beach Gardens Police Chief Clint Shannon and William, said Williams has no known connection to the area, Williams' DNA linked him to the crime. And let's see. The news outlet located Williams' purported YouTube page, a collection of videos accusingly seemingly random people, accusing seemingly random people of gang stalking, child endangerment, and police misconduct. YouTube videos placed him in the vicinity of Palm Beach Gardens at the time of Roger's murder. The now deleted videos also helped investigators track his whereabouts prior to his arrest. The day after Roger's murder, Williams posted a video saying, somebody attacked me last night. They had people ride past me on bikes and I've been getting physically assaulted. They put implants all over my body, in my eyes. They can see through my eyes. Boy, this, this is just crazy. Williams was initially questioned, but not arrested because he was committed to a hospital under the state's Baker Act. 
Police say a chance encounter between Rogers and Williams resulted in the teen's death, but he did not provide specifics regarding what the interaction entailed. The boy's bicycle was found on the ground near his body. Williams has a lengthy criminal history, which includes arrest for battery and aggravated assault. Despite this, police say there isn't a known motive in the current case. He added, the incident, in, the incident itself appears to be a completely random account, uh, act, I'm sorry. Prosecutors intend to seek the death penalty. While the defense will likely change the psychologist's findings, challenge the psychologist's findings. Oh my gosh. Beautiful kid taken. Oh, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Okay, I think we've got to uh, head on back to our video because I think we have to go. It's time to go to the next one. So we're going to be covering the Brophy trial next. So if you want to come with us, just don't do anything. It'll direct you, and we'll see how many of you can follow and um, come with us over to the next true crime video okay so I'm going to end this one and come on over